Book of Hours is a game that doesn't tell you everything. In fact, it tells you almost nothing to start, but true to its name, it is a book. You will read and you will imagine things. It is forthcoming and will tell you everything. It is a game of experimentation. And it attempts to pull off a difficult balance that games about knowledge have to approach. Originally, I expected this game might be an interesting window into discussing the portrayal of the esoteric, a way to merge my understanding of cults and orders with a game, so to speak. But in truth, the game is not especially interested in that. Its predecessor somewhat was, which makes sense given it was called Cultist Simulator, but this game is, frankly, more interesting than that. Having gotten a CD key for the game from the publisher to try it out, I've found there's a better target for discussion. Also, real quick, if you bounced off Cultist Simulator and it was for reasons of the ambiguity of the setting, time, place, or lack of grounding, or the uncomfortable time pressures of the game which make it a bit anxiety-inducing, you'll be more at home here with Book of Hours. Granted, those two quote-unquote issues of anxiety and untethered setting are highly defensible choices that added to the game, not bad design, but they also likely made a barrier of entry. Here's the question that Book of Hours helps us get at. When wisdom, particular insight, is the core of the game, but not something the player uses as a player's skill, how does one present knowledge? What I mean here is that the game isn't checking your knowledge with a flat stat or an XP bar where one arbitrarily gets better at opening locks or casting a fireball, nor is it a series of quiz questions that are trivialized on the second run or with a walkthrough. It's not about the player character leveling up, nor the player's skill as a person, their knowledge of the game. It's about the experience of accumulating insight. The question then becomes how well things come together to pull that off. Now, this isn't a review per se, but unlike a lot of games I cover, I don't exactly expect the audience to know this one, so here's a basic grounding. This is a game about washing up on the beach of an island. The first thing you do is check yourself for signs of who you are and why you are where you are. It happens to have been your destination anyway. And soon a memory of fear hits you, accompanied with a Lovecraft quote. And for a moment this feels like it sets a predictable tone. You meet a local fisherman who will hardly speak to you. Stop me if you've heard this one before. But then you have the means to make an introduction. You know someone from the island. You are connected to this place. And so it becomes that he talks to you, and soon enough the memory of fear leaves you and the game steps out of Lovecraft's shadow and becomes more about communication than fear, more about aid and recognition than desperation and conflict. There are still unknowable hidden truths to discover and disquieting discomforts to be had, but the burn into them is slower and they've shaken off what I can only really describe as the questionable slime that often coats the work of Lovecraft, the allegedly necessary xenophobia. And through that connection, through many connections, the game transforms a bit. Where it might have stuck to a hostile outsider relationship and still centered knowledge and learning, the learning aspect can now sort of evolve into a grander iteration. Learning becomes more than just consuming records of the past with centuries of distance, but more a cooperation with a living people, and their aid rather than resistance in uncovering more of the past. This leaves us with two things to explore instead of just one. Knowledge, the solitary act of knowing, but also learning, the reliant act of consuming the past and experiences. In the face of that latter element, the cooperation of the village and the delving into the past, we end up at another important question. Can one truly learn on their own? But for now, let's step into the more pressing question. How does Book of Hours handle the idea of knowledge and its accumulation through learning? Book of Hours is a game that doesn't tell you everything. In fact, it tells you almost nothing to start, but true to its name, it is a book. You will absorb the words of others, the knowledge of the past. It is forthcoming and will share with you. It is a game of education. And it attempts to be both about the possession of knowledge and its active accumulation in learning. The player most feels the connection between knowledge and learning when interacting with books. You are, after all, a librarian. That interaction is itself learning. So why have I drawn the distinction if they're so intertwined? Well, I find that many games, and unfortunately some real-world people, take a position that knowledge can just 
come from nowhere. Leveling up does this. Now, I'm not asking for like some hard magic explanation or a system that mandates I read and understand a full block of in-game text in order to cast a spell, mind you, but the spell coming from somewhere is, to me, far more interesting than just materializing a new ability at a level up. To take, of all things, Skyrim as an example, I don't think they lose much in having spellbooks not be books you read, but they certainly gain something in having spellbooks at all. Going a step further, having things in games one can intuit rather than having it explained to you is often considered a sign of emergent or immersive sim adjacent design. For instance, if you could technically bumble your way into casting a spell without having to unlock it first. But I'd say that the practical lack of a hard barrier and the technical lack of instruction strengthens the value of learning. The learning feels almost more grounded in a world where the spell always existed and you just didn't know it, didn't have the knowledge. In that light, leveling up and just magically knowing a new spell or knowing how to stab better doesn't really feel like knowledge, it feels like a game. And yet, despite the potential pleasant feel of that Symphony of the Night example, it has the obvious downside that prior player knowledge is overvalued in that situation. While it's something I'd sometimes call good and rewarding design to have persistent spells and reward player knowledge, in a game that is about the relation of learning and knowledge, like Book of Hours, that ordinarily compelling design would be detrimental. So, to me, the dichotomy exists between player knowledge and character knowledge. Book of Hours leans towards character knowledge while leaning away from things like ungrounded ability unlocks. That's not to say you won't learn how to play the game as a person, of course, just that you can't skip a section by memorizing a password or something. Very often character knowledge is represented by a number, a numerical value that unlocks new things. Book of Hours also has abstractions, but the way the game abstracts knowledge isn't just some singular stat. It's a dedication to different paths, different lenses. It's the breaking down of expertise into elements of sorts. And those abstractions are sometimes vague. It is important for the tone of the work that the player isn't told everything, that there's a sense of uncovering and exploration, that knowledge is earned. It is important that one doesn't go in being able to anticipate the value of every little element. This is where I'll bring in some mechanics and, at the risk of dampening the game's exploration a tiny bit, explain some things. Most everything you do is bound to what the game calls principles. Think of them as constituent parts or associated elements. Elements is a bad word to use here because the game uses it for something else later, but just bear with me. In another setting, this might be something like, ah yes, the astrolabe grants you a plus one to wind power, or this candle is made of the fire element, but here the constituent parts are more built around use, ability, and perception. They're sometimes less literal than candle equals fire, but sometimes just as intuitable. Astrolabe equals sky. Where many games center the use of items, Book of Hours centers the intangible. Skills and things like memories or the elements of one's soul. Think of those, for a moment, as objects to be used. The game tells you what a memory is made of, and through that, what obstacles it might help you overcome. Mousing over principles shows you things that use them or grant them. Your foremost duty as a librarian is cataloging. Cataloging books at the desk can use many principles, edge, grail, moon, and winter. These will often come from parts of you, the part of you that longs to preserve, the part of you that dreams. Some objects may help. Thinking about the weather might help. And once a book is identified, that doesn't mean it's read. Sometimes other languages are necessary. Naturally, this blurs with learning, and for that reason learning doesn't get its own discrete section. As soon as we've stepped outside ourselves, the two things intersect. What is the point of using knowledge to catalog the book if not to then learn from it, to share knowledge? As I said before, this isn't a game where one simply intuits how to cast a fireball. One seldom just knows things. The consumption of books, the act of learning, is emphatically a reaching out. The game is driven by providing a sense of mystery, a drive to pursue knowledge. A great example of finding balance between the known and unknown and making something comprehensible but still mystical is the Tree of Wisdom, which is best, though roughly, compared to a skill tree. It's more the path one takes in knowledge, and at first glance it's overwhelming and weird looking, with the most intuitable elements being the linear progression lines. 
But in practice, the rest of the chart isn't all fluff. There's stuff to read here that is quite helpful, partially obscured though it is. The names with a colored tint like neon, hushery, birdsong, preservation, etc. are ostensibly esoteric schools, paths one can take. The solid color words and the accompanying lines may seem unrelated, but they correspond to principles. Lantern, knock, forge, moth, grail, etc. This chart, with a bit of study, leads players to understand what they'll need to pursue the path they want. Some are easy to intuit without the chart, like forge being about creation and fire and ithistry being about creation and fire, but that's not always the case. On my first run, I ended up with the journal recommending I take up hushery, because my initial elements of whist and fet angled me towards the principles of lantern and winter. As you can see, hushery the line intersects those solid colors. Imagine how different the experience of learning the game would be if talking about it didn't make you sound like some weird esoteric wizard. It would be, frankly, less interesting if I was just saying more mundane nonsense words you've heard elsewhere before, like geomancy instead of bosk, the lore of primeval wood. Yes, it ends up being another layer of potential difficulty for learning, but it adds something that this game is selective in when it uses shorthands itself. And that adds to the curiosity just as much as it removes the power of prior player knowledge. Put another way, this stepping away from more common language means that you come in with fewer expectations and predictions. Compare having to guess what's involved with Bosk, the lore of primeval wood, to your expectation if it had been called nature magic. There's nothing wrong with referring to Hushery as the necromancy path in explaining it, the game itself does that, but there's something to embarking on the path of Hushery, you know? As for the gameplay, ultimately it's a system that clicks, but also clacks. The issue is that while the game as a whole isn't a hellscape point-and-click adventure game, sometimes you do just get the urge to slap things into place till they work, and the problem is that that can sometimes get you by a little, and the game is averse to explaining things in ways that don't just become a mystical barrier of curiosity, but a straight-up barrier. Nothing guides you towards understanding the constituent parts thing found in principles. You'd have to be innately curious as a player and note that there are symbols in the top right corner of the screen that represent constituent parts and necessary inputs and all that. You see a thing in the corner that looks like an orange hammer or a yellow knife and your brain goes, that's right, the square hole. In a sense, me explaining it to everyone here might have taken that moment of figuring it out from you, but I'm wagering that this is the spot where the absence of explanation has a ratio of intrigue to confusion that is far tilted in the direction that puts people off. I'm extremely curious to hear from people who went in blind what their stumbling blocks early on were because understanding principles and their place in the game feels like a potentially common one. Even having played the previous entry, Cultist Simulator, this wasn't the most intuitable thing because, frankly, that game had the same problem. A core difference is that Book of Hours starts with a screen that says, this game is forgiving, where Cultist Simulator starts with a screen that basically says, you'll fail and try again. Those may sound like the same thing, but the difference is that Book of Hours lets you set your pace more, while in Cultist Simulator you die if you forget to go to work for like three days. Okay, wait, let me put knowledge aside for a little in order to contrast Book of Hours with its predecessor. Said contrast highlights some things. I liked Cultist Simulator, enough so that I spent a few days trying to learn how to mod it to see if I could use that to make some interesting visuals for my video on Theosophy, actually. It didn't go well because I was being a bit ambitious. Frankly, it's hard to talk about Book of Hours without comparing the two. Book of Hours is in many ways a refinement of the last game. I think no better symbolized than by the names. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but Cultist Simulator always felt a bit like marketing or bait. It's certainly more related to the simulator genre, but while the game is a bit looser slash more sandboxy than Book of Hours, it never felt like it was, frankly, a simulator game. It felt more ambitious than trying to replicate a surface level aesthetic. I don't know, maybe that's my own bias to unpack, but I tend to think of insert edgy word simulator as a formula made for just doing visually wacky things or having like two rote moments that YouTubers endlessly trot out in thumbnails until the hype and memory is murdered. Not everything is a strict improvement, though I'd hesitate to call any change bad. Cultist Simulator is and isn't a management game, and it is and isn't a simulator. It is about managing a cult, but putting it in either of those genres sets up expectations that the game simply won't meet, because it's not trying to actually be within those genre archetypes. 
Cultist Simulator leans in on tension, on time, on constraint. Or to put it another way, this isn't the kind of management sim where listening to lo-fi beats would feel appropriate. The most notable change to me in going from Cultist Simulator to Book of Hours is that while still being a tell-don't-show game that uses imagination, the world is less abstract. In Book of Hours, you, the librarian, are part of the world, not distanced from it using cards on a table as your intermediary for everything from going out on the town to sleeping off illness to planning a heist. And I would ultimately argue that Book of Hours being more interested in grounding things gives a heightened contrast between the normal world and the eldritch, between the strange and the normal. Yes, there's value and tone in having your game play out on a surreal table in a darkened space, but starting in a weird place kind of dampens the weird when the weird starts happening. I firmly believe that any story involving a descent into madness, or a dark path of the eldritch and unknown, or even just dips into allusions to real-world esoteric movements needs to have a point of contrast. Too much otherworldly without grounding and, okay, now it's basically a space game or whatever? There needs to be a reality that's getting bent or you just risk immersing someone in somewhere else. Cultist Simulator is full of mystery in its writing, but it often indulges in exploring very human things like ennui, that is, death by boredom, with the same tone as delirious madness caused by glimpsing infinity. The whole game feels weird, so you don't even really note when you've begun crossing the pale. And of course, back to the name, it's called Cultist Simulator. Getting weird is the point. You expect it. This ties us back to another thing I think Book of Hours does better, connecting the player to the sources of knowledge. Cultist Simulator had you send a goon to the shop and he came back with whatever, or you'd go to the bookstore and just end up with a book without any real deliberation. This was in line with the untethered, floaty nature of the whole game, again, a table in a void. In Book of Hours, you're doing the interesting part. You're the goon picking up books. You're the person out in the world. And ultimately, that starts to feel like doing archaeology rather than just buying some random item you can't even see beforehand. Book of Hours is about that active engagement, about finding the places where the past meets the present. This is a game where you rely on the knowledge of others, and I don't just mean like in the way party members in games have different focuses or abilities. You both rely on the expertise of villagers who know what you do not, but also extensively on the writings and learnings of those who came before you, on the inventions you find in a mansion, library, fortress thing. When villagers assist you, it is in lending you their principles. Further, you borrow people or pay for their time with your words or coin. Where this might make it all feel a bit transactional or mercenary in some games, I think here it helps cement that your life is intersecting with these people who have their own lives, and that they're taking time out of their own day to help you with your weird tasks like breaking into a walled garden. You are special. You do have a distinct purpose and goal in the world, but it's not at the expense of making everyone else purposeless or comparatively incapable. Far less than building up expertise on your own and becoming a master of everything, you are relying on others. They help you excavate the past, and the past itself bears understanding, and understanding the past helps you more. You aren't ever going to invent the truth of the universe on your own. You're always uncovering, always borrowing. Lent knowledge like a library lends you a book. Lent aid by the people who collaborate with you. There is no way to play this game without any form of aid, without accepting that reliance on others, be it through books by which knowledge echoes through time, or through the aid of others in the present. Now, none of this means that this game is about characters with complex lives and schedules that you witness, it's not aiming to do that. And I'm probably only making that comparison because my last video was about a Zelda game doing just that, but I do want to clarify that this isn't like Animal Crossing meets Shadow over Innsmouth. And from that, I want to emphasize once more that the inclusion of the village as part of your experience goes against the general expectation of Lovecraftian-inspired works. The absence of ceaseless hostility and distance and othering makes Book of Hours more than just picking up journals and piecing together what happened to this place, because this place is more than just an excuse for terror. All of this to make a point. You know what you know. 
The player knows what the player knows. That is within you. And you learn from who you learn from, from what you read, from what is told to you. That comes from beyond you. I'll use one final example. The world is not our own. Book of Hours does not take place where you think it might, but rather an entire world that is similar to and dissimilar from our own. Again, for reasons of exploration, I'll be sparing here, but I'd like to use an example to make a point. The island is off the coast of Cornwall, the currency is shillings and pence, and the time is the 1930s. But when you read the description of pence, it notes them being from a dead empire. The setting is the 1930s, but following something called the Restoration of 1930. Some kind of alternative history is going on here. Even if you thought you knew, from your own player knowledge, what it would mean to be a Cornish island village in 1930, you do not. You cannot intuit the world of this game on your own to any grand extent, sheltered in your prior knowledge. You have to step out of it, to learn, in order to add to it. From mechanics to setting, I think Book of Hours balances well both the act of learning and the possession, the quasi-itemization, decimalization, of knowledge. It is a deceptively tricky thing to pull off, and they manage. A lingering question might be, does the game reward player knowledge? Keeping things in mind. Prior knowledge. Well, remembering keywords, constituent principles of certain things, simple stuff like that, sure, but more than anything, what it rewards is curiosity. Thanks everyone who watched the video and did subscribe stuff, and thanks to Weather Factory for the key. The game has been on my radar since they announced working on it, so it's cool to get to talk about it. And of course, thanks to patrons, with particular thanks going to John Ursaw, Defender, Freddy, Galactic Beyond, Le Sing Afame, Mark Soto, Michael Kelly, Nick, Nude Sleuth, Sipper Turnipsy, and Queen Naked Morap. I've got a quasi-history game on my list for likely candidates for next video, as well as one or two non-game ones and some other ones. We'll see where it goes. Uh, bye. <laughs>